Welcome everybody to Introduction to Deep Learning. Um, today we're going to talk about advanced deep learning topics. And the goal of this lecture is, first of all, to give you an overview with a lot of the things that we have learned so far in the course. Um, and to make this overview clear in terms of also what further advanced directions you can go to. So while we might not be able to go into detail and depth into every single topic I'm going to talk about today, um, I hope this is creating a bit more appetite for more research. However, I still want to cover a couple of very, very important basics um, that might be useful for later on once you continue in this exciting endeavor. And with respect to advanced deep learning topics, of course, we've already talked about some stuff in the previous lecture. We've talked about attention and how this kind of attention is so important and critical right now in modern architectures. And the one architecture that is particularly important is this type of transformer architecture, this extremely famous paper, Attention is All You Need, which is now essentially the basis of all kind of large language models such as ChatGPT, GPT-4, and stuff like that. And today, um, I want to touch, as I mentioned, I want to touch a few more topics. And I think these are very, very important topics. I could probably do, you know, an entire an entire course about each of them individually. Um, but I still wanted to start by giving you a very good overview. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is graph neural networks. So, so, so far, um, this course has been very much dictated by computer vision. Um, the reason is because we do a lot of computer vision and um, we like processing images, we like generating images. However, I also want to highlight that neural networks can be pretty much applied to a lot of other domains as well. And graphs is a very important domain by itself because the graphs, by definition, they're very, they're very versatile, they're very flexible, and they can be applied to a lot of problems. And I'll show you a couple of these applications that I have in mind here. Um, but first, I want to introduce a bit of a concept. So, of course, graphs is nothing that is new to you, right? Like everybody has done some introduction to computer science lectures, introduction to algorithm lecture. Um, graphs is something that you should know, right? So what we have for a graph, we have a bunch of nodes, um, we have a bunch of edges, and what we have is essentially the nodes, they potentially store some information, um, they have some attributes associated with it, and then you have edges that connect these nodes, right? So this is nothing new. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard about it. So we have nodes and edges. Um, there's two types of graphs in a sense. We have um, directed and undirected graphs. Um, so here in this case, you see a directional graph. So you see that the nodes, they have a source and a target node. Um, but in principle, there's various applications where you might hi have either of them. Okay, so now the big question is, um, well, what, what, I mean, I can name a few applications, um, of course. Um, if you're talking about social graphs, like social media and so on, if you're looking on Twitter or so, you're having followers um, and you have notes. Um, and the notes, basically, they, um, they are the people and then you have the followers, they are basically connections. And these connections are, in this case, directed graphs because one person follows another person, right? Um, so this is kind of the concept of graphs. Now, the big question is, how do we do deep learning and graph concepts? And then I'm going to show you a few applications. So. Deep learning on graphs is actually not, not that new. Well, not that new in, in its relative. Um, so even in 2009 or so, people have been um, proposing very concrete neural models for graphs. And, and the concept, however, is pretty similar to what we have seen before. So basically, um, it's a generalization of neural networks that can now operate in these graph structures. And graph structures is always defined, defined by nodes and by edges. And here are a couple of, I would say, four very important papers in this, in this domain. I think you can look up. Um, so this 2009 paper here is one of the more conceptual ones. Um, this paper from Thomas Kipf and colleagues from 2016 um, allows you to do graph convolutions on, on graphs, actually. Um, and then there have been a couple of new newer papers, like this message passing paper from 2017 is very important, I think. Um, and there have been many more um, in the concept right now. So I want to quickly go a bit more generic to the problem. Um, I want you to highlight a bit of the challenges on graphs itself. And I think there's two parts of the challenges. So the problem with graphs is, is basically you don't know how big they are. 
right? So if I'm gonna have like a social network, right? Or I have a bunch of nodes, like the number of nodes is, is kind of variable, right? So you have no clue how many nodes you're gonna have. You also don't know how many edges you're gonna have. Um, and for every sample you're considering, you might have a different number of nodes and a different number of edges. And that, that's very tricky in a sense for neural network architecture. So if you're thinking about like an MLP, an MLP wouldn't give you that because the output and the input dimensionality of an MLP is always the same, right? So the dimensionality is fixed in this case. But as we have seen here right now, we have to find something um, that makes this variable. There's a couple of differences in graphs. There's like when we talk typically about standard graph neural networks, we actually mean a simpler version of the generic graph gen um, networks. So the simple version of this is basically that within one sample, the edges and the nodes are going to be fixed, but between edge uh, between samples, you're going to have a different number of nodes and edges, right? Um, but you could go even a step further and say, well, my number of nodes and edges are going to change throughout the network for one sample. That latter case, we're not going to talk about right now. In this case, we're going to say we have a graph, we know the nodes for one sample, we know the edges for one sample, um, but for every sample, we're going to have a varying number. Okay, the next thing we have to figure out is we have to have some concept of invariance to the node permutations. Well, you might ask, what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. So if I'm going to say I have a bunch of nodes and I'm going to just number these nodes, right? So I have node zero, node one, node two, node three, node four, until node n. Um, you're going to have this little issue. You have to, at some point, commit to an ordering of the nodes, right? So if you're changing the ordering or the indexing of these nodes, um, you don't change your graph by definition because the graph topology is still going to be exactly the same. And the content of the graph is also the same. So you need to have a way as part of your neural network to be invariant to these to the order of, of, of the permutations of the graph, right? Uh, and this is really critical because otherwise it doesn't work. Um, again, to give you an example here, if you're having an MLP and in an MLP, you have, let's say, 10 inputs in the dimension, right? Um, it matters, of course, like how you order the inputs here. Like that's not so straightforward to do. So you have to find a way in the architecture itself to realize this invariance to the node permutations. Okay, so these are the two main challenges we have to deal with. Variable number of nodes, permutation invariance. Um, so what's the general idea? Um, so this is a this is a figure from this this famous uh, paper from from Thomas Kipf. Um, this was this famous graph convolutional paper. Um, I don't want to go into all the details of this paper, but I highly encourage you to look at it. Um, however, I wanted to go to a very general idea first. So let's say we have a graph, right? Okay, this is our graph. It has a bunch of nodes and a bunch of edges. Um, and now what we can think about is this graph um, can have features. It could have features in both nodes and edges, right? Like an edge could have a feature or a node could have a feature. But an edge as a feature is something that you could debate, but let's just assume an edge has also a feature in principle. And now what we would love to do in a hidden layer, we would like to have a way to somehow, between the graph nodes, somehow propagate information, right? And the way you would love to do that is something like this, right? You wanna have information that starts here and then you iterate and then the information propagates to the next node, then the information propagates to the next node and so on. It's kind of like a convolution, right? If, like, a, like a convolution on an image, if you think about it. Let's say if I have three by three conf kernel, then my, info in, um, my information with every layer propagates a little bit further. Remember when we talked about um, receptive fields and so on. And for graphs, it's the same thing, right? So basically you have like, you have like a node, you take, like, you take this node here, you have like surrounding nodes. So this node will be somehow influenced by the surrounding edges and the surrounding nodes here. And then when you do one layer update, basically, or you go one layer down, you're basically getting information from the from the layer, uh, from the from the nodes that are like further away, and so on. So, uh, and that's kind of the idea, right? So the core idea here is we want to figure out how to propagate information across the graph nodes and its edges for several iterations. And most of the time, the, the quote unquote iterations they are often done via the different layers. But there's different ways how to do this in practice. Okay, um, yeah, and then the, the graph will update it with the context of our nodes. 
um, and the respective features that are associated with that. But now I want to give you one concrete example. Again, I mentioned there's a couple of ways to do this, but I want to give you one concrete example. How can we propagate information in a graph um, across several iterations? And one popular way to do this is called message passing. So message passing networks is one specific way how you propagate information throughout the graph. And the way you do this is you essentially go ahead and divide the propagation process into two steps. You have a step that goes from a node to an edge, and then you have a step that goes from an edge to a node, right? So let's say we're having a graph here. We have here one, two, three, four nodes. We have one, two, three, four edges connecting these nodes. Um, could be directional, could be undirectional, right? Like either one is fine here. It's not so important right now. Let's just say for simplicity, these are, these are non-directional. Um, and now what we would love to do is we have one thing that is called a node to edge update. So we have some operation that tells us from this node, please propagate some information to here. Um, we also take information from the adjacent node here. So we have for one edge, by definition, an edge can, or an edge is connected to two nodes. Otherwise the edge wouldn't exist, right? Um, so the edge here has two nodes. And what that means is this edge feature is receiving an update from the adjacent two nodes. So every edge, this green feature here gets an update from these two. This green feature gets an update from these two here. This green feature gets an update from these two. This feature gets an update from these two. Um, this basically says for one edge, give me an update from the respective nodes around it. And now we want to do the opposite. Now we want to go ahead and say, well, edge to node updates. Now, if we're taking one node here, like this node, this yellow node, this node should receive information from the surrounding edges. So in this case, we have three edges on this node. Um, and we're going to get here information from three of the nodes as an update, right? And then we iterate. So we first, we, we kind of do this iteratively. We first do node to edge, edge to node, then we continue node to edge, edge to node, node to edge, edge to node, right? Very simple, right? You just keep iterating and keep iterating. And not giving a spoiler away here, this part is a little easier in a sense, because for one edge, as I said, we know that we have always two nodes adjacent to it. So this is a function that we know the number of nodes that influence one edge. However, in this case, where we do edge to nodes, the number of edges incident to a node is varying. It's varying per node. Every node has a different number of edges. This, this node here has one edge. This node here has three edges. This node here has two, and this here has also two. So now we have to have also here, we have to have an operation that is kind of varying. All right, um, but let's do the easy thing first. Let's do node to edge updates first. So if we're doing node to edge updates, um, we have a very simple mathematical formulation here. So what we're assuming here, we're gonna say we have here some sort of hidden feature. Uh, this hidden feature is defined at a given time step in the message passing. And we call this time step L right now, right? This is our L time step. Um, and we say this hidden feature here is connecting two nodes. And more specifically, it's connecting the node I and the node J, right? So for this, for this edge IJ that connects the nodes I and J, we're gonna have at the time step L, we wanna have some sort of feature that we compute here. This is my hidden feature here, okay? Um, so now, how do we compute it? Well, we have some function that computes this edge feature, which we call n, um, and we're gonna get three inputs here. We're gonna get an input feature from the two nodes that are attached to it, and we're gonna get a feature from the previous time step of the edge, right? So what we're doing here is we're saying, well, there's a feature from the node hi, we're having a feature from the node hj that is adjacent to this edge. And we're gonna get the edge feature from the previous time step L minus one. And of course these, these node features from are also from the time step L minus one, right? So from the previous time step, this is this L minus one here, you're gonna get a two node features that are adjacent to the edge and the previous edge feature. And that's what we're gonna take as input to compute the new edge feature. That's all we're gonna do, right? Okay. Um, yeah, and these are, I mean, to, to go through it, right, these are embeddings of the node i in the previous message passing step. This is the embedding of the 
edge ij in the previous message parsing step and this is the embedding of the node j in the previous message parsing step. Same thing what I just said before, right? And all we want to do right now is we want to basically compute this feature, this green one from the new step. Uh, we want to compute it based on these, uh, on these three previous features that we had here, right? Okay. Um, and now the question is, how does our function n look like? Well, the simplest thing for n here is we just use a learnable function. Hence, you know, we are in a deep learning class, so we need to have some sort of neural network here. Uh, and the simplest way to do this is we simply use an MLP, right? We just say we have a learnable function that takes the previous embeddings here as input and computes the new embedding, and this is just an MLP. And the key here is that this MLP is actually shared across the entire graph, right? So we have one fixed MLP that is conditioned or takes as input the respective embeddings of the nodes in the previous time step edge features. Uh, however, the weights are actually shared across the entirety of the graph. And this is really important because that means it doesn't really like, you know, like the number of parameters in your MLP is not going to change with the graph structure, right? So the number of nodes do not de depend, uh, determine like how many, how many weights we're going to have in this, in this N here, right? Okay. But I think it's pretty straightforward. So we have a global MLP that's always the same. It takes input these features and computes the new edge feature. This is how we do node to edge updates. And the way we do this, of course, we're learning this across the graph. Okay, and now we need to do the other way around. Now we need to edge to node updates. That's the second round. So after we've done the edge update, we're running the edge to node update and each edge embedding um, wants to propagate its information to the adjacent um, vertices, right? And the way we're going to do this is we're now going to look at this from the perspective um, of the node. So now we're going to say um, this mi here, this is the message, uh, a time step L. We want to figure out, um, uh, we want to we wanna compute this somehow. Um, that we taking now the, each each of these edges generates a message, and we'll take the edge features here as input, right? And for one node, we're gonna have multiple messages coming as input, right? Okay. So how do we do that? Well, um, we need to have an operation right now that when we're computing the update of all these messages that come to one node we need to figure out that this is um, an operation invariant operator, right? Um, so in other words, when we're now going ahead and saying, well, I don't know how many nodes I'm going to have, uh, sorry, how many edges I'm going to have adjacent to that node, I, I, I have to find a way to be invariant um, to the number of inputs here. And the simplest thing what we have learned here is actually we can just use some sort of pooling. And so we can use a max pooling, we can use a mean pooling, we can even do a sum. Um, so the simplest thing is you use a max pooling, right? So you have n edges that point towards a node. Uh, you're just gonna take um, some sort of order invariant operation, in this case a max pool, and say, oh, take the maximum of all the edge features around here, okay? Um, that's what this could be. This could be a maximum function. And then you're gonna get the message that you use to update the respective node, right? Um, and you can also use the mean, you just do an average pooling, it's the same thing. Um, and you take, again, you take the features of all of the edges around this node, you're gonna compute this, this average feature, and then you're gonna do a respective update. I would say average is a pretty common and very good way to do this. Um, you can also use something like a sum, meaning that you just sum up the features of the adjacent edges, but you have to be aware that if you're doing that, your expected output is going to be more dependent on the number of edges. So you have a graph input. Um, so you have a graph node with a lot of edges. The, the, the total feature size will grow, right? Because you're adding more stuff up together. So you have to be very aware of, of, of how you do that, right? Um, so yeah, that's something you have to be very much aware of. Okay. Um, but yeah, high level concept is the same, right? So now we have all the edges, they're propagating their respective information back to the nodes. And then all we have to do is we have to update the respective node features, right? Uh, and the way you update the node features, you take this message for this one node that is being accumulated with this function here. Uh, you take the previous node feature, 
and you're running an MLP again um, that computes this update, right? So this MLP just combines the information from the message for the node from all the adjacent edges um, and it does take as input the respective previous node feature and then it updates the next node feature, right? Um, yeah, this is again, this is an MLP and this MLP is sharing the weights across the entirety of the graph, right? Okay, I think this is pretty straightforward now, right? Like again, you have the first this message operation with, which does some sort of pooling and is order invariant um, and you're getting a message update step and then this MLP here combines the, the respective update step uh, with the previous feature. Okay, so yeah, so the aggregation provided in each node embedding uh, with contextual information about its neighbors, right? That's very straightforward. Now, in this case, because we do this iteratively, right? Like the information update now, this spreads over the entirety of the graph and you can have many, many iterations and many, many rounds of message passing here um, that eventually um, propagate features on your graph. That's it, that's the simplest thing. Uh, and this is called message passing and this is a very common way to do learning on graph-based structures. I didn't say this is the only way to do it. I only said this is one way. Um, I want you to keep this in mind, but message passing in itself is very, very popular and a lot of people are using it. Okay, I wanna talk about, um, so this is probably what we're gonna talk about in the context of this course on graphs. Um, however, I wanna talk about some, uh, some applications on graphs. And there's actually quite a few of them, right? Um, so if you wanna do some sort of node or edge classification, um, then you want to have a graph network, right? So basically you have some sort of graph structures input and what you're getting is you're going to have some result on, on the edges or on the, on the nodes that tell you, oh, is this a node? What is going on in this node or something like this, right? Okay, so simple thing, right? If you have something like, um, I don't know, you have like um, a social, social network, right? Um, you wanna wanna do some sort of discovery in a social network, how information propagates, like basically how long does it take for one node to propagate the information somewhere else? You can train on these kind of things. Um, you can go ahead and use anomalies, which I think is kind of cool. So if you're treating like like email traffic and stuff like this um, in networks, um, like you know, you have like a router and then you're treating every router as a um, as a node, you want to figure out how network traffic behaves and you want to figure out spam and fraud based on that. Um, you can train networks through that, right? And can basically say, oh, is this node forward, forwarding any, any spam, right? You train some classifiers on it with a graph network and then you can basically figure out um, what's going on in your network structure. And this is very, very common. And then there's practical applications as well when you're talking about recommendation systems. So recommendation systems for the most part um, are based on graph networks. So if you think about I don't know, like on Netflix, you have a movie, you wanna watch a movie, and then every movie becomes a node in the relationship to the movies you have watched, um, other movies, for instance, um, and or you do it on a user basis, right? You see basically things, what your friends, like you are the node then, and then your friends are, your, are the other nodes, and then you have connections to your friends, and then you wanna figure out um, how your interests propagate and so on, and you wanna classify this based on some metadata and attributes that you have. Um, so, yeah. Um, then there's things like, you know, when, when you have like a pandemic, like when, when COVID hit, um, we can have uh, modeling the epidemiology. Um, you basically, um, this is an example of, um, you basically go ahead and divide all the counties in, in a certain region into, into nodes, right? And you want to figure out, oh, how does my stuff spread over time? Um, then you can make uh, very good predictions with machine learning models actually right now when you have enough data and you model these kind of things as, as graph networks. Um, you can also go ahead and do traffic forecasting, like when you're thinking about you're in a city, right? You're having a bunch of cars, um, you have some sort of travel data and you're dividing your, your, your road into some sort of segments, right? Um, and then you, over time, when you're collecting more and more data, um, you eventually can, can basically formulate a graph network um, over these road segments and then you can predict, you know, what are good routes to take and so on. And this is basically um, what Google Maps or something like this would do, right? And you can figure out um, how traffic is going to behave and then give respective recommendations when you want to do traffic finding. Um, to be more specific, right, you want to, for instance, figure out, oh, based on the current traffic situation in a specific city, um, how is it going to develop in two hours later, right? And then you run a graph network over it and you try, based on the previous data that you had, you try to extrapolate like what your model would predict here. 
Um, you can also do things like scene graph modeling. I think that has been very popular in computer vision, right? Remember all the stuff we have done on object detection and on instance detection, uh, instance segmentation. Um, you can now go ahead and, and basically take these results from these detectors and you can go ahead and model them to scene graph. And then you can, for instance, do even things on videos, right? And like propagate scene graph information over time and see how certain models are, uh, are moving forward. You can do things like object tracking. You have dynamic objects. You want to track them over time. Um, you can model various relationships and so on in scene graphs. And yeah, this is typically something that um, is based on, on various graph neural networks that exist right now. Um, you can also do things like mesh classification. Um, that's something that we have been doing a lot in our group, right? So we do a lot of stuff on 3D data in my lab. And for instance, if you have like a 3D model, a 3D graphics model is nothing else but a set of vertices and edges and faces. So that one you can formulate as a graph. And based on this graph, you can then decide, oh, this is for instance, a dolphin or it's a fish. And the way you do this is for instance, you have kind of a, a graph based encoder architecture that, that computes essentially features, geometric features for each of these nodes, propagates the information to neighboring nodes and eventually comes up with a classification result. Um, actually, this is one work from our group as well. And um, we've been looking at 3D mesh generation as a generative process, right? So for instance, if you want to figure out how to generate a 3D mesh as an output based on some condition, like let's say you have a partial point cloud as input um, and you want to figure out how to generate um, a 3D mesh as output that is a very clean, nice mesh, um, this is also a graph generative network. In this case, it becomes pretty interesting because um, now in 3D meshes, right, as I mentioned, you have vertices, faces, and edges. So you have three concepts now. But there's these concepts where you first predict basically vertices, then you predict edges, like which vertices are basically connected. And then the way you do faces is kind of interesting. So you treat it as a dual graph. And a dual graph means that now all the faces becoming the nodes. So the, the face graph is the dual graph to the edge graph. Um, and if you're interested in that, there's a lot of stuff on computational geometry or so that goes into much more depth, how to model these kind of things. And then with graph neural networks, you can actually operate on this. You can formulate both discriminative and generative neural networks um, that you can use. And then, yeah, at the output, you're gonna get a nice mesh ideally. Um, and I don't know, I think this is kind of a cool area because it, it's like, you know, in computer graphics for 3D scene modeling, or object modeling, um, that's kind of a very, very natural application here. Okay, that's mostly what I wanted to talk about graphs. I think graphs are super exciting and super interesting. There's a lot of very practical applications to it. Um, in a sense, they generalize what we have done with CNNs on images, right? So image and, uh, images are the easier domain, um, but in practice, of course, you have other domains where you don't have regular structures. And if you don't have regular structures, you might have to consider formulating things as a graph. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at some new topics. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite topics right now, generally in, in, um, in deep learning or in AI in general, um, which is generative models. So if you're going right now on, um, I don't know, if you're going on social media on Twitter, this is where you see a lot of this information. Um, generative AI is kind of a really, really big hyped up thing right now. Um, and the reason why it's so hyped is because stuff starts to now work. Like, you know, when I started going to this area, like maybe, I don't know, like seven, eight years ago, um, everything was kind of at the beginning and it was very challenging to get anything to work. And um, yeah, now things have changed. Now, now things are getting better and better every day. And I think it's very exciting. You can do just so much cool stuff with it. You can do image generation, video generation and so on. Um, so what's the high level concept of a generative model? Um, so I'm going to talk about generative models, right? Mostly in the context of images, but I would like you to be aware that most of these concepts are, are actually generalizable. For instance, they can be applied to graphs, right? Um, and so on. And that I think is still something that is very interesting. And yeah, if you're thinking about it, um, we, what does a generative model do actually? Um, if you're taking a generative model, what the input is, for instance, we're gonna take real images as input. We're gonna have a bunch of examples and we define those ones as real observations. And the idea of a generative model is that from this training data, we would love to learn a model that is able to generate new samples 
that are not part of the real images, but they look like real images, right? So they're from the same distribution and they are virtually indistinguishable. That's the ideal case. Um, but they're kind of like generating new samples, right? So like this, this um, take n samples as input, generate me new samples that look the same. That's essentially what a generative model is. Um, I also wanted to start maybe with a very quick high level overview. I'm sure a lot of people of you have heard a lot of concepts. Um, we can't go over all of them, but we're going to probably have a few of them covered reasonably well. Okay. So generative models, there's basically two things. There's a, there's a thing called explicit and implicit density. That's the way the sampling stuff worked. Um, if you have an explicit density, you literally have a PDF and you sample from the PDF. Implicit, well, you don't have that necessarily, right? Okay. Um, so there's tractable densities, there's approximate densities. These are kind of the, the different ways. What's very common is variational models, like variational autoencoders, for instance. They're very common. Um, you're also going to have Markov chains. They have like approximate densities. Um, Denoising diffusion models, um, they fall into this category. We're going to talk about this one. This is like what stable diffusion and stuff like this is doing. Um, you're also going to have like direct methods for implicit densities like GANs. So there's no, in, there's nothing enforces an actual density there. Um, so the density is like implicitly learned. So GANs is the way, is the other like big direction. I think these ones are pretty much orthogonal in a sense how they work. Like, you know, for variational autoencoders, you know, diffusion models, you basically model everything as kind of a Gaussian distribution from samples. You're enforcing that distribution in your latent codes. Um, whereas with a GAN, you're just scanning this more or less implicitly um, based on how the training works. Okay. Was well, very high level overview. Uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of a, yeah, a very high level, uh, a very high level um, intuition. Um, I'm going to start with something much simpler. I'm going to start, before we start in any of the complicated stuff, I think we have to start with autoencoders. Um, I have mentioned this a couple of times throughout the lecture, but I think we've never really gotten into it what autoencoders are. So autoencoders, they have basically two, two ways to be used. So autoencoders can be used as a basic generative model. Um, however, they can also be used for, for some sort of like representation learning. So you can have an unsupervised uh, learner that is based on an autoencoder to learn some sort of features where you have no labeling, right? You can, you can basically train features without any labels. And an autoencoder is very, very straightforward. So an autoencoder, what it's doing is it takes as input an image. Uh, it has a bunch of, in this case, convolutional layer. This is a confinet. And these layers are organized such that you have an encoder here first. So in other words, we're going to go here down in the spatial dimension to a bottleneck layer, right? So from this image, we're going to have a bunch of convolutions and the convolutions are designed such that this bottleneck layer has a significantly lower spatial dimension than the respective input. Okay. Um, now what you do is um, we want to have an um, an encoder that goes then from this bottleneck uh, sorry we have an encoder that goes from the image to the bottleneck layer and now what we want to do is we want to have a decoder that goes from the bottleneck layer back to an image right so again the decoder is a series of in this case transpose convolutions right we've talked about this what transpose convolutions are um, the transpose convolutions they gonna just go up in spatial dimension. Right? So here the feature dimension is high, spatial dimension is low. Here the feature dimension is 3 because it's an RGB image. Um, and the spatial dimension is the width and height of the image. And here it's the same thing. It's RGB plus width and height of the image. Right? Um, and the idea is basically that you can go ahead right now and um, have an image here as input. Feed this in this encoder. Um, get a bottleneck feature. Feed it through the decoder. and get an image out of it again. And now what you're doing is you're saying this output image should be the same as the input image. And in this case, you might just have an L1 or L2 loss on a per pixel basis to make sure that this output image is the same as the input image, right? Um, and you don't need any labels, right? You just need literally a bunch of images and you're feeding these images as input. Um, and this is what autoencoder training looks like, right? So you take a bunch of images, you have these input images, you're feeding these Im images as input, you trying to reconstruct themselves. So it's a self reconstruction task. And we're going to get these reconstructed images output. So if we are overfitting an autoencoder to a large 
So if you have a large order encoder network and overfitting it to one image, we would expect we pretty much get the same images output. But now since we have many images in the order encoder training, the order encoder can't memorize all the images anymore and has to find some common patterns to kind of compress the, the images in this bottleneck layer, right? Um, and the reason why there has to be some sort of compression is because this feature space here, we call that latent space, this latent space here has a feature dimension that is significantly smaller, spatially speaking, than the input, feed, uh, the input dimension. Right? So the spatial dimension here becomes smaller. This is why we, we're forcing the image kind of to be compressed. And the idea by forcing this compression is that this network here learns some sort of like elegant way of compressing this image and learn some shared features across images. So the more data I feed in, right, um, the more powerful this network is, eventually I want to be able to encode the image just with a single latent code here, right? Um, and yeah, and then we have the self-reconstruction loss. There's no labels required. Um, and we can train an autoencoder. And this is a very basic concept that you often see in machine learning or in deep learning specifically, that there are some sort of autoencoder-like structures. That's one part. Um, but there's also a lot of people who are using autoencoders for all kinds of tasks. Okay, so now let's say we have an image here. Um, we're feeding it through a trained autoencoder. Um, and let's say this is trained, right? Uh, we're feeding this image in, we're gonna get some output, right? So now the question is, we can actually use this autoencoder as a generative model. Well, how do you do that? Well, the simple thing is we're training this autoencoder, but then we're throwing the, the encoder away. So we're throwing all of this stuff on the left-hand side away. So all we're keeping right now is the decoder. And for this decoder, what we're doing at test time, we just, we just literally have a random bottleneck vector here, right? So we just have a random vector here that we're feeding into the decoder. And assuming this decoder was trained on enough stuff, you're gonna get some image out, right? So it's a generative model. So I train it on X images, and I hope that if I feed in a new random vector, I'm gonna get some sort of output uh, at the way, right? Um, so now in, ter in terms of terminology, I mean, I'm gonna use this a bit right now in the following slides. Uh, we do have a latent space Z. Uh, we're having a feature dimension Z that is much smaller than X. This is important. And in this case, when we're treating the order encoder as a generative model, we're literally sampling Z. And this is the most basic generative model you could imagine. Everybody can do that. Um, the only little downside is it doesn't work that well. I'll get to this in a second why it doesn't work that well this way. And part of it is here, there's no loss enforced in this latent code. So this is like, how do you sample from this is not so clear, right? So it would be nice if we had a bit of structure, like how this, ideally we want a distribution here. So that, that's one thing. And the second thing, this, this L2 loss or L1 loss for the reconstruction, that's also not that great because it tends to be very blurry actually, right? Um, yeah. So we'll talk about this one. Um, but our encoders, they also used, I mentioned this before, right? They used for pre-training. You can basically use um, images for self-reconstruction and then use the encoder as a feature extractor. It's kind of the opposite of what the generative model is, right? The generative model here, what I just said is they're using the decoder and throwing the encoder away. So for feature, uh, for feature pre-training or for, for um, yeah, kind of like self-supervised learning methods is the opposite way. You typically keep the encoder and throw the decoder away. It's kind of interesting. Okay, and then yeah, the second use case is you can use them for, for all kinds of pixel-wise predictions, generative models. Um, people use it for upsampling, like low resolution to high resolution image upsampling, image to depth map prediction, stuff like that. You typically have autoencoder style structures there. Okay, but now I wanted to talk about this problem, what I mentioned before. Because in my latent code, I would love to have a real distribution. That would be great because I'm arguing this gives you much, much better results. And doing that um, basically is a variational autoencoder. Um, so variational autoencoder takes the concept of an autoencoder. Um, where we are, right? This is still our same autoencoder. Um, and we want to enforce a distribution here, right? Now the question is, how do we do this? Well, if we are taking an autoencoder again, we have this bottleneck layer. This is just our autoencoder. We're having our X, we're having our X tilde as our reconstruction, and we're having our Z, which is our latent code here. Uh, the autoencoder, what it does is, right, encodes the input representation and reconstructs it with the decoder. 
Uh, you actually can get, this is kind of funny, by the way, if you take it, uh, this is a TSNE visualization of MNIST, you actually see some structure in these latent codes. This is kind of like an unsupervised structuring. So if you want to, this is one of the few times in this lecture where we're not going to do supervised learning. This is self-supervision in a sense, or like unsupervised learning, where now you want to do some sort of clustering based on just the data structure itself. So, um, like for MNIST for the numbers, you actually get a very nice separation between the different digits in the order encoder space. Okay, but we want to do a variational order encoder. Uh, so now we're going probabilistic. So what we want to have is we want to have um, uh, two distributions here. So we have a we have two conditional distributions. Um, so we have in our uh, encoder we're having phi as our weights. We're having our decoder, our theta weights. Right. Now what we would like to do, we would like to make sure that our now our encoder is a conditional distribution that basically takes x as input and predicts me our latent code z. Makes sense, right? Uh, and z is a distribution based on whatever you're feeding in here, right? Um, so that's that. Um, and p is the opposite. p takes as input our latent code z. And with latent code z, we want to sample and want to get x as an output respectively, right? So q is our decoder. q is our decoder depending on the weights of phi takes as input x and predicts z. Uh, p um, is the decoder, has the, the weights theta, uh, takes as input our latent code z and predicts x tilde, which is an image ideally. Right? And the goal now is we would like to sample from this latent distribution to generate new outputs. Um, I said this before, but now the big difference what we would love to do is we would like to enforce that z lies on a distribution. And Whenever I say that, pretty much in every machine learning course, um, this is always a gosh. <laughs> okay, so now we're assuming this is a distribution and we will force it to be a distribution. Um, and we're forcing it basically to be a Gaussian. So now what we want to do is that our encoder here uh, predicts a distribution where we have, um, we have a mean um, and a variance. Um, and we would like to make sure that we can then sample from that one, right? So like this, this mu and the sigma here, they're basically, they're conditioned on x here, right? This is what we would like to do. And then we want to sample from the distribution. In this case, we have a Gaussian distribution with these mu's and sigmas that are dependent of the input. Uh, we can then go ahead and reconstruct with the decoder, the respective image x tilde. That's all we want to do. Um, this is not quite a variance because, right, it's a multidimensional thing. Um, it's actually a diagonal cross covariance. Um, what that means is just it's a set of independent Gaussians. That's all we want to do, depending on the dimensionality here, right? So um, that makes it actually pretty straightforward. Um, and yeah, this is the mean here, this mu. Um, and then all we have to do basically is we have to, for the encoder part, we have to make sure that this is a Gaussian, sorry, this is a, a, a laden code that is modeled as independent Gaussians. That's all we care about right now. Um, so we're feeding x here as input, we have our phi, and we want to make sure that whatever output z we're getting lies on this Gaussian here, right? So we're forcing this to be a distribution. So we're going to have a specific loss that makes sure this uh, distribution um, a condition is fulfilled. Okay, um, and then training now, uh, the loss makes now sure that the latent space is close to a Gaussian. That's making sure we have the distribution. And the second loss, what we're making sure is we are making sure that the output reconstructs the input again, or it's close to the input, right? You still have like an L1 or L2 loss here um, that, we, that we correlate in the self-reconstruction thing. Um, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff here, just, just so you're aware, like how to enforce this loss. There's a bit of a KL divergence going on here, right? Um, to make sure these distributions match and so on. I'm not going to talk about this one right now. Like I, I would encourage you to look it up, but this goes a little bit beyond the scope of, of this specific lecture here right now. So, um, but the high level thing, what you have to know is we're making sure this is actually mapped to a, to a set of independent Gaussians. So we have this Gaussian distribution, we can then sample from it and we make sure that we get the same images output. So we have actually these two losses. One, make sure it's close to the distribution of a Gaussian. And the second one, make sure that the decoder reconstructs the original input image again. Okay. Um, and this is the training and we can train this right now. And in comparison to the autoencoder, now the testing is a lot better and a lot better in terms of the quality you get. And the reason why the quality is better, now we have actually 
this is a proper sampling from this Gaussian here, right? So from this distribution of my latent space, I can now go ahead and draw samples from according to the distribution that I have trained before. Um, and then feed those ones, those samples that follow this distribution, feed them to the decoder, right? And yeah, that's basically it. And here you see a couple of examples on MNIST. Uh, right, MNIST is this little like toy data set um, or like a few tens of thousands of, of, of images at a very low resolution that have this, these handwritten digit numbers on it. Um, and the point is an autoencoder tends to average everything out. If you're doing this with an autoencoder and you sample in this latent code of the autoencoder, since it's not modeled as a distribution, it doesn't, it's not a probabilistic model. It's just the loss of this L1 or L2 reconstruction loss goes down the most when you just compute an average output. So right, so you, it tends to basically, if you train this for too long on too much data in a sense, then it tends to basically just produce this blurry blob that is always the same average output, especially on something like MNIST. Why on special MNIST? Well, MNIST has this black background, which is always the same. And now I just need to average the numbers out, an average that gives me pretty good loss actually. And to have a proper explicit probabilistic model here, Autoencoder solved that. And on MNIST, this looks a lot better. Um, so you now see actually that, oh, we can suddenly distinguish the individual numbers. Um, and we have our, I would say, first reasonable generative model, right? This is the, the simplest, well, okay, the simplest generative model is the autoencoder. It just doesn't work that well. Um, but this, this variational autoencoder actually works, I would say, already to a, to a certain level, right? You still see it's a little bit blurry, right? It's not, not super high fidelity in the output. It's something, right? It's it's doing something compared to the standard autoencoder. And you can actually do this not just on these simple data sets. You can do this on some other stuff. Um, this is on a face data set. Um, and now you can actually force also attributes to be encoded with that. Now you can say, oh, we have a head pose included. You have a degree of smile included. And then you can sample these orthogonal distributions um, as part of your latent code. And you can actually interpolate between them and use it to a certain degree of like, you know, image-based editing and stuff like that. And I think that is super exciting. I think this is cool. This is our first viable generative model. Okay, let's summarize quickly what we have done here on the generative models. Um, we've talked about autoencoders. So autoencoders, um, they're reconstructing the input. Um, they can be used for representation learning and they're kind of this kind of basic generative model, but it doesn't really work that well. Uh, the variational encoders extend that and they're using a probability distribution in the latent space, in this case a Gaussian. Um, you can use it to cover to, to, to correlate this with certain interpretable attributes like head pose, smile and so on. And then at test time you can go ahead and, and generate some outputs by, by simply sampling from that space. And that, that's that. Okay, these are the simplest um, generative models. Make, make it a bit more complicated. The next more complicated version is a GAN. GAN is something I'm pretty sure people have heard about. It's called Generative Adversarial Networks. And Generative Adversarial Networks is a thing that have also kind of this exponential growth curve. A lot of people are using them. Lots of people are using them. You see this graph, like I'm cut this here off. Um, okay, I didn't update the slide, but um, I would say the growth curve of GANs has been slowing a little bit down. And the reason is what we'll talk about later. Diffusion models came afterwards. So, um, but, but GANs in itself are very, very popular. And I want to talk about why they are so popular. Um, so we talked about autoencoders here. And autoencoders have this little bit of an issue that they are produce, producing very, very blurry results. Even in the training, even for the training samples, like you're going to get often results like these ones. And the main issue, why you're getting this um, is because, well, you're having a reconstruction loss here that is an L2 loss. And at test time, this makes it even worse, right? You're going to get very blurry results here. And often what I said is in this MNIST example, it just averages the whole data set out, right? So that, that's tricky. There's no real probabilistic model here. Um, so, and if you're using an L2 loss here, um, this means the optimum of an L2 is actually the worst case in a sense, because an, an L2 norm um, where the mean is basically the optimum <laughs> means I can reduce the loss quite a bit by just always predicting the average output. It's just a natural issue of an L2 loss. 
Um, L1 loss is a little better for certain ways, but it's still the core concept. If you take the average, you're gonna get a pretty good result. Um, and if you have local features, the model from an optimization standpoint will lot, rather choose to average stuff out. Um, yeah, compared to um, yeah, compared to doing like actual fine scale detail. Now, big question is basically how do we change that? And this is what GANs are doing. The big challenge what we want to do is we want to replace this L2 loss function. We want to have a function that is tailored towards giving me local details. And the idea of GANs is we want to learn that function actually, right? We want to have a function that is learned and tells me, well, how far are we actually away from this image? And of course, this is not an easy task. If I give you two images, tell me how close they are. You have to train all the network in itself. And that's kind of what, you know, what, what generative adversarial networks are doing. Um, so what they're doing is they're introducing this concept of a discriminator. So this discriminator here, um, so this is basically like, if I'm going back here, this part here, go from Z to, to the image again. This is called the generator. This is called Z decoder, give me an image. This part here is kind of like a decoder. This is the, the, the second part of the order encoder, right? Late encode Z, it's a sample. Uh, generator is a decoder. And this is a sample that we got as an output. This is an image. And now this learnable loss function is what we call the discriminator here. And this discriminator, it tells you basically well, it should tell you, we'll, we'll see how it goes, uh, but it should tell you how close are you to a good image here or how close are you even to the image you just fed in. Um, but since this is not so easy to do, the discriminator operates slightly differently and there's different versions of this. So in the original paper from Goodfellow, Goodfellow is, uh, Ian Goodfellow is a very popular researcher in machine learning. Um, he has introduced these GANs. Um, the idea there were basically um, to say, well, the distance that we measure is not with respect to one concrete um, self-reconstructed image, but we basically want to say, well, if I generate an image here, can you tell me if it's a real image or not? That's what the discriminator tells you. And if I can't tell you the difference anymore, it looks like a real image, then I'm good, then I have a low loss. If I can tell you that it's not quite looking like a real image, right? if I look at the image and it's like, oh, no, it doesn't look very good, then the discriminator would say, oh, it's a pretty high loss. And this is what the discriminator is doing. The discriminator is nothing else but a binary classifier that tells you, is this image that I generated, is it a real image or not? Now, the discriminator now has to be trained. Like the discriminator, how on earth do we know it? So now I have to basically go ahead and say, my discriminator needs to see images that are generated and I need to compare it with other images that are from a real distribution, right? And as you might have seen, none of this pipeline right now takes even an image as input. Like this is just give me a latent code, generate me a sample, discriminator tells me if it's real or not, and the loss is how, 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 how right was my discriminator. That's all we're doing. Now, the only way to figure this one out right now is to say, well, we're now taking real images as the ground truth for my discriminator, where I know it's a real image. And my discriminator now takes samples from a real distribution it takes these samples as input and I know the ground truth there. I know that my, my real images for my discriminator are going to be, are going to be a real image. That one I know for sure. Um, I also know my, my generator, if I generated it, I know my discriminator, that's not a real image, right? However, my generator and my discriminator, they are adversarial now. These guys, they're gonna fight each other. So my generator is supposed to go ahead and say, please generate me an image that my discriminator cannot generate anymore. And my discriminator tells me, oh, please make sure my classification tells very much apart what from this distribution and this distribution is, tell them apart, please. And I have ground truth labels and I wanna get the loss down, right? So I have two competing optimizations in a sense. One of them, the generator fool my discriminator, the discriminator make sure I can, I can figure out that this was all fake from my discriminator, uh, from my generator. Um, and I'm training these two things jointly, right? So to make this more clear in terms of the, of the losses, what we're trying to do. So my discriminator right now, it tries to make sure that my real data is recognized as one, meaning that it's a real sample, right? That's all I'm doing when you have for my real data, I sample a sample, feed into the discriminator, and I get a loss that says, please discriminator, make sure that this classification tells me as one.
So I have a ground truth label here. Now, from my fake data, what I do is I generate some noise. Typically, it's a Gaussian as well. Um, I feed this into my generator. I generate an image out of it. I feed this generated image in my discriminator. Um, and now I have two parts of my function. I have my function for now that says, well, my, dis my generator, the di sorry, the discriminator tries to make sure that I recognize this as fake. And my generator tries to make sure that this one is actually real. So I want to make sure as a generator that my discriminator is wrong and, well, falsely believes this is a real image, right? Uh, and that's the whole point of a GAN. Um, the losses in practice look like this. It's just a binary cross entropy. It's very straightforward. Um, and we have two losses. We have a discriminator loss and we have a generator loss, right? So the discriminator loss is the important one here. The discriminator, well, they're both important. The discriminator loss just says, well, um, from my real data, from my real data here, give me one sec, I need to turn off my AC. One sec. Okay, I think we got that one under control. All right, so, so we have these two losses, one for the discriminator, one for the generator. Uh, for the discriminator, right, we have this binary cross entropy loss that basically says, if I feed X here's input, which is a real sample, right? This is my one term. This just makes to make sure that the real images are classified as real. Um, so this one should, um, should be one. Uh, and this one here should be zero uh, because now I want to make sure that my sample that is generated from the generator, my discriminator recognizes as a fake. That's what my discriminator is optimizing. Well, and the generator is very adversarial. The generator says, um, I want the opposite. I want to maximize the loss from the discriminator, right? And now you're going to end up with this minimax game. So what we're trying to do is not a real optimization in the sense that it goes to zero. In fact, we're trying to stabilize these kind of things. So we're trying to make sure that my generator minimizes the probability that, is, that the D uh, is, is correct. Um, so it wants to maximize the loss of the discriminator. Um, and the equilibrium here is the saddle point of the discriminator loss, right? Um, and the way it works is the discriminator provides you supervision gradients uh, for the generator, right? Um, and this is really important that you train these two things jointly. Okay, so why is it important to train these things jointly? Well, imagine if you only trained the generator and kept the discriminator fixed you would essentially just figure out a way how to fool the discriminator by, for instance, having some low-level adversarial noise that would distort the image. Um, but in practice, it would not get you better images for the generator. So the whole point here is basically to take the discriminator as part of this training process, make it stronger, and only if the discriminator becomes stronger, you can also get good gradients that are in turn then help you to optimize the generator. Um, and I think this is really cool, actually. Um, I think the scan formulation is, is really nice. Um, there have been, I should say that, there have been a lot of variations of this um, formulation, like Wasserstein losses have been used. They rely on some, some distribution matching. Um, they use earth mover distances. And there have been a lot of research right now to modify these formulations because the one drawback is that the training might not be super stable. So for instance, if this equilibrium kind of collapses in one or the other direction, like for instance, either the discriminator is too strong or too weak, um, then you don't get very good results. So it's a bit finicky to train it, but in a sense, it's kind of cool because you, you can actually, it's very versatile. You can apply this to a lot of directions. So in a sense, what you're trying to do here is you, you're learning this loss function um, by trying to match the distributions from the respective real samples where you're choosing from. And I think that's kind of cool and it's had a lot of impact. And I'm gonna talk about a few applications here. Um, oops, um, yeah, so a few applications. Um, so the one application that in computer vision has been pretty important is image generation, right? Image generation was the big thing. So basically the idea is you have um, a set of images given, you train again on it, and you sample your distribution that you've just trained on, and then you can generate new samples that you have not seen before. And it took people quite a while to get this to work. So the original paper by Goodfellow, um, I think they tried to train this on MNIST style images. 
Um, but then later on, people try to to make this more um, well, more applicable to to real world sized images. And it took quite a while to find the right architectures, find the right hyperparameters, and so on. Um, and this is an example called Beggan. Um, that's one of the works um, that was done um, from Instru Lab. And these folks actually they produced pretty high fidelity images, and this was around like 2013. So you see, it took from the original style GAN, uh, from the original um, uh, GAN introduction, it took a couple of years to get there. And then another big milestone was the StyleGAN work. Um, that's a work by, by NVIDIA um, and colleagues. Um, so they had a couple of them. It was not just one StyleGAN paper. They had like StyleGAN 1, StyleGAN 2, StyleGAN 3. Um, by now, so they have even another successor here. And the idea there is basically they trained this specifically for face generation. This was one of the things um, that they were very interested in. Um, and they also like... They still followed the original um, GAN formulation, but they had a lot of variations in the architecture to allow it to actually produce very, very high quality images at the end of the day um, up to a pretty high resolution. And if you are interested in that space, I can highly recommend um, have a look at the style GAN paper um, and then also try out the existing pre-trained style GAN versions. So there's two things actually that I think are pretty important here. So one thing is like, figuring out how to design an architecture that makes the GAN stuff work, right? Like play this Minimax game, make sure you have the right hyperparameters and so on. So these guys, they did a lot of engineering and a lot of bookkeeping and figuring out what the right architectures are. And that helps you really a lot. If you had to start from scratch, like that's a thing I would not recommend doing. And the second thing is they actually also have the pre-trained models online. So you can take these models and then fine tune them accordingly to your specific application. Um, for instance, one thing that a lot of people have been doing in the context of StyleGAN was they took a pre-trained StyleGAN and then figured out how to navigate the latent codes, right? So for instance, they, they try to correlate with attributes, say, oh, I want a smiling face. And then they search the, 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 the code in this space of StyleGAN in order to figure out um, how to generate an image that is smiling, for instance, from the same person and so on. And there's a couple of really cool stuff around it. Um, and yeah, what I want to, want to say here is basically like, you can actually play around with these, with these pre-trained networks and can can just, you know, interpolate in their codes and then can do a lot of stuff on top of it. Um, and they have done a lot of heavy lifting for you. Um, there's another kind of interesting line of work. Um, they You can also use this for, for image to image translation. So if you want to, for instance, convert horses into zebras, or zebras into horses, um, there has been a really cool work called CycleGAN. And the reason why I'm mentioning specifically this one out of so many papers is this is a different concept. This is not just trained on a single discriminator. In fact, what these guys are trying to do is they're trying to have horses here, zebras here, but you have not a one-to-one -one match, right? And this is called an unpaired setting. So you don't have one-to-one -one matches between these two domains. Um, but the way how, um, how the cycle can work does it is basically it says um, have a generator that converts a horse into a zebra, have a discriminator here and says, please make sure this is from a zebra. And then it has another direction that says, please take a zebra, convert it to a horse, and then has another discriminator here and says, please make sure it's a horse. So it has kind of two discriminators. Um, it has a discriminator that says horse and it has a discriminator that is a zebra. And what they do is they train this simultaneously. So they convert it first to a zebra and then they convert it back to a horse. And the reason why they're doing this is they want to make sure there's a cycle consistency such that this horse matches roughly the shape when you convert it to a zebra, right? You see like this shape here, the silhouette here is pretty much maintained here. And this is only possible because there's a loss that says once you converted it to a zebra, it has to be converted back again to a horse and look like the original image. And that's what these guys say, it's a cycle consistency loss. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting because it opens up a lot of new possibilities where you don't have matching training data. So this unpaired setting is actually very common in a lot of practical scenarios. Um, like um, one example, what I'm specifically interested in is if you want to take, for instance, synthetic data um, from, a, from a synthetic environment and want to make it like a, like a, look like a real image that was taken with a photo, um, you you don't have these pairs, right? You can't just train a conditional GAN that says, oh, convert me the synthetic rendering into a real rendering. You have, you, but you can use these kind of cycle ideas. And this is a thing that a lot of people have been adopted for various kinds of applications. And um, the reason why I'm mentioning it specifically here is like, I just wanna show how versatile these GAN formulations can be and how great if researchers were actually in using them in practice. Um, yeah, you can do things like 
um, image-based editing based on semantics. Um, I think this is kind of cool. This is more on the line of con conditional GANs. This is a um, paper called SPADE, um, Semantic Image Synthesis with Spatial Adaptive Normalization. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but the, the core application, I guess you can see, right? You have the semantic map as input, um, and then it provides you a layer of subtraction where you can edit this input in order to force um, the image to you know, have a certain shape and so on. So think about it like the Photoshop of the future. Um, it's probably going to have some sort of filters or interfaces that look like these ones. Um, you can actually um, also do... No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You can also do stuff in, in 3D. So this is a work that um, I have been involved in. Um, uh, this work from my from one of my students, um, Javis Dicky. Um, so he's been working on texture generation. Um, in this case, you basically have uh, 2D... Um, 2D training samples, meaning you just have photos of like cars, chairs, and so on, and you want to have a version how to use these ones in order to create textures on 3D models, right? So what you care about is you have a 3D model that is untextured, you want to create textures on top of it. And um, the point is here, the GANs are pretty, pretty versatile because they allow you to formulate a loss function where you have an unpaired setting in 2D with 2D images, has no segmentation, nothing. Um, and you can use that one um, to essentially um, have an unconditional texture generator in 3D. And I think this is also kind of interesting because like you can you can jump between these different dimensions here, right? You have 2D loss functions, but you create eventually uh, 3D content at the end of the day. Okay, um, so that's probably it for now for, for GANs, what I wanted to talk about. Um, with that, I wanted to move on to the next category of models. Um, and the next category of models are diffusion models. And diffusion models is also extremely, um, extremely recent, even more recent than GANs when it got a lot of attention. Um, so specifically in the middle of last year, you saw a massive spike here. So diffusion models have been around for a bit. Um, there's a lot of theory behind it. I can't cover all the theory, but I want to talk about a bit um, how you know the high level, the high level ideas work. So you get a bit of a, a rough understanding. Um, and here you see a timeline of search interest on the web with diffusion. And this, this, this spiked up last year, mid last year, right? Like summer last year, you had a massive search. And the question is, why did diffusion models have such an interest? And the, the point was, there have been a lot of really amazing applications that came out that were built on top of diffusion models. Um, to be precise, like these state-of-the-art image generation methods, um, they nowadays all use some sort of diffusion. Um, so you might have heard of DALI, you might have heard of Imogen, you might have heard of stable diffusion, and all these kind of works, they are built on a diffusion model. Um, so if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend Google Stable Diffusion. Um, that's an extremely exciting work that was actually developed um, at LMU, the sister university here in Munich. Um, and these folks, what they did is basically they have image generation and they scale it up with a large amount of data and they showed that they can actually produce um, text-based image generators that are extremely powerful. And yeah, so... This is what Diffusion can do. It's great. A lot of people are talking about it. If you haven't heard it, I would really recommend Googling it because that's just something you have to have seen. Okay, so what is Diffusion? Well, Diffusion, the Diffusion process is actually pretty straightforward. So um, imagine you have an image. So we're going to take this image here. Um, and what we would like to do is we would like to gradually add noise to this image. Right, so we, we, we're adding a noise process on top of this image. So we have this image, add a little bit of noise, add a little bit more noise, a little bit more noise. And at the end of the day, you have essentially just random noise left, right? So here, this is just pure noise, and this is the actual image. And you have this, the, the sequential step here um, that basically starts with x0, where x0 is your input image. And now you have this series of t time steps. It goes basically x0, t minus 1, t until t um, and it goes to pure noise at the end of the day right and the idea is that you essentially model this distribution q um, is a conditional distribution here that takes x of t minus one as input and predicts x of t right so i basically i want to go here um, i'm going to add some noise and i go to xt right I, I basically go always to the right here um, this is the forward process 
And now what we would like to do is we would like to train a network from this from this forward process that does the reverse operator. In other words, I want to start with random noise and I want to recover the original data. And this is a probabilistic model, meaning that if I run this diffusion process like um, if, you, if you run this like 10 different times, um, you're going to get also 10 different results because you have different noises here that is input. And this, this denoising model, it has a prior that is trained on the respective data set. For instance, you generate images of faces and then you generate um, different faces if you resample this noise process. Okay, so I already mentioned there's two parts that we have to care about. There's a forward uh, diffusion and there's, there's the reverse process. So forward diffusion means take an image, add noise, end up with random noise. And then the backward process is what the networks are being trained on. They want to recover, they want to reverse this process and want to recover the original image and kind of bake in this prior from this image data set and make sure that from random noise, you can now sample new images and generate new images. Okay, so how does it work? Well, we have first this forward diffusion step. Um, the idea here is this is a Markov assumption. So each Markov assumption means each step only depends on the previous step. Right. Uh, this is basically what this Q is. This Q is a is a real distribution, right? Um, and sorry, this Q is a distribution, and this distribution means um, you take uh, x of t minus one here as input and predict x of t, right? So this is you sample, given the current state, you sample what is the next noise state here. This is just add noise here, um, and you're starting with x zero, right? So x zero then samples from the from the real distribution of images. Um, then you're going to add some, um, you're going to add some noise, you're going to add some noise, going to add some noise, going to add some noise, and eventually you end up with pure random noise, right? Okay, so we have this uh, Markov process, meaning that each state just depends on the previous state, um, and we model it with this distribution Q, where we sample from, right? Um, and this, this distribution Q is like everything what we're doing basically is all based on a Gaussian distribution. So what we have here is we have the xt is our our uh, our sample we're choosing. Um, we have a oh yeah we have here our mean. Um, the mean is uh, defined here um, a, a part of this distribution. We have the variance here um, the, the sigma t, um, and this is basically an identity matrix that can be modeled with this. Um, uh, with the standard deviation here. This beta t here is our standard devi deviation that we care about, right? Okay, and if we model the diffusion process, we simply uh, continue applying this Q all the time, right? This is just sampling from a Gaussian distribution, right? And we, we apply this iteratively until we end up with random noise. Um, and that's what we can do now, right? We can go ahead and say we, um, we just simply continuously apply this distribution. So we end up with this product of these distributions um, and the distribution in itself that always depends just on the previous process, uh, previous step. And that's what I mentioned. This is basically this Markov, um, Markov assumption um, that is being employed here. Okay. Um, and in practice, um, you might might ask, you know, like how many steps here or whatever do you need? Um, well, um, in practice here, you you can have up to thousands, several thousands of steps. Um, so it's a question how to make this efficient. Um, but I want to mention here, at this point, all we have been doing, we just sample from a Gaussian distribution, right? We have done, there's no network at this point. Um, it's literally just, we have an image, we're adding noise to it. That's that's what forward diffusion is going to be, right? We just, we just adding noise to the image. That's all we do. Okay, um, but since I mentioned now, we're applying this distribution and this noise sampling many, many times, uh, we have to ask ourselves about the efficiency. Because as I said, we could have thousands and thousands of steps or at least hundreds of steps. Um, so in practice, I think thousands is typically a number people use in practice. And there's a little bit of math here. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but I just want to give you a bit of a, of a sense of what we have to look out for. Um, and one thing what people do here is um, they're going to start essentially um, with this reparameterization. Um, so basically we have a uh, Basically, what we have here is um, we say th this this beta here was our standard deviation, right? So we just say this one minus beta is just some reparameterization here, and all we're doing is we have now this product of these variances, and here these epsilons they are just random samples of the unit Gaussian here that we care about. Um, and then the the denoising is nothing else but saying like oh we have um, x t minus one plus some noise, right? So we have the previous image 
which had already a bit of noise and we're adding more noise to it. And these ones are just telling you, oh, you know, how much, uh, yeah, how much, how much noise do we already have there, right? Um, same thing here, right? This is our, our variance here that we care about, or our standard deviation in this uh, case. Okay. Um, and now what we do is um, this becomes a recursive process, right? So now you, you're doing this over and over again. So now what we do here is we know that um, uh, we have now x of t is dependent of x of t minus 1, which then in turn is uh, dependent on x of t minus 2, um, and so on, right? So you just have this recursive process that you iteratively apply. And the idea here is that basically you can reparameterize this with this alpha and just end up with this formulation here. So in, in this case, you can basically say uh, within uh, one step, I can go to from x0, I can go to xt. That's the whole point. So you can rewrite this recursive formulation as a single sampling step. That's the point, right? Um, and now we have xt. It, it only depends now on x0. Um, and it has xt as an, as, a, as an output then afterwards, right? So this is your condition. And the point is that you can rewrite this such that this is a, a, a one-shot step. This is the efficiency pro, um, thing, what I mentioned. And the point is here that these alphas, um, they can actually be pre-computed. Um, the, the idea is that um, if we sample this noise at any time step t, and um, and wanna wanna get this in one go, we we can actually pre-compute all these alpha t's, um, and these epsilons they can also be actually all the same noises. This is why this works. So if these epsilons here are the same noises, then this applies, and then you can basically go uh, in one step and get this xt in one shot by just giving the original um, input here. Okay. So this is the this is the forward diffusion process. All this is doing right now is basically saying, well, I have an images input. I successively apply this noise. I, de I noise the image, noise the image, noise the image, noise the image. And this one just says that through this reparameterization, you can just do this in one go. And basically, depending on where you want to be in your Markov chain, you can get in one with one closed form in a sense. You can figure out how to get this one sample that you care about. Um, and now what I mentioned is now we have to do this reverse process. So this reverse process is the opposite. So since this becomes now um, a Gaussian distribution, we want to figure out um, how to reverse this process. So right. So we have we said we have this Gaussian distribution here. We can sample our xt. Um, this is our Gaussian noise that we have at the end of the day, and we want to run this reverse process. And the idea of this reverse process now is basically that we're starting with random noise. Um, we want to maintain. Um, the distribution properties that we had before. However, we want to create a new sample. And creating a new sample means we essentially generate a novel data point from the original distribution, right? So, and if this is trained, let's say, on enough images, we can basically use this reverse process now and starting from noise to generate new samples that follow the original distribution that we have used to, uh, to train. Well, how do we do it? Well, um, we use a neural network. Now the neural network comes into play. Um, and we model this reverse process with a sequence of neural networks. So we're approximating this, um, this solution with a neural network. So what we say here is we're approximating um, what we had here, right? Um, this Q is now parameterized with a model of P of theta. Theta are net network weights. Um, P is a neural network. Um, in practice, these are mostly units with skip connections. Um, there's a couple of different architectures, but it's mostly a unit. Um, and then we're simply applying this uh, unit to it. And now what we're doing is we're saying, well, um, our neural network P of theta, right? Um, it's gonna get me, it's gonna take xt as input and gonna get xt minus one as output. So like, right, I start essentially here and I wanna go one step here to the left. I wanna get stuff one step here to the left, one step here to the left, one step here to the left. Um, and what that means is respectively, P is approximating this distribution here, right? Um, and we have to do this many, many times, right? So we're starting here from the right. We have here at the beginning, we have this random noise uh, where we have no condition as input. And then we have respectively the previous denoised com um, condition as input. And this is um, what's called this denoising process now, right? So now we start with noise, we denoise, the, the, we denoise it, um, and we successively remove noise essentially. And this basically means that uh, we can apply this n times 
uh, where n was the same time that we did the forward diffusion process. And we're using this, um, um, this network P to approximate this process, right? And the idea is, of course, the more images, the more data we throw at it, um, the, the better this, this approximation becomes. And because this approximation becomes better, then ideally we're going to get good images out that follow the original distribution, but on new samples, right? Okay, so in principle, this is not that difficult right now, what I've said, um, but I have, I have ignored one part actually, right? Um, so the, the one thing is very straightforward, right? We just do the forward process, we do the backward process, backward process, um, is approximated with this network P, which is, as I said, typically a unit. It saves the current state somehow because it's a Markovian assumption um, and it gets you the images as output. Um, but now the, the, pro the question is, how do we train this P? Um, and this is something that goes a little bit beyond the scope right now. There's actually a bit of math behind it. Um, but when you're training these diffusion models, you need to have a certain loss function. And what that means in practice here is you optimize a log likelihood of the training data. So in other words, what you care about is you want to make sure that this model P here, right, matches the distribution Q when you're going through the entirety of the Markov chain. Um, and this is measured in a distance that matches the distance between two distributions. And this is the kullback leiblet um, distance. Um, and that is actually the loss function that is then used in order to figure out the respective parameters theta here that do this one. So I'm not going to go into all these details here. Um, there's a very nice blog post actually that explains this step by step. Um, but I think the high level thing you, you need to know about is basically um, this is nothing else but optimizing a negative log likelihood to make sure that this model P uh, approximates the distributions that we had originally when we applied the forward process. Um, and when you're doing this, the nice part at the end of the day, you essentially end up with a closed form solution here. And all it does at the end of the day, it just compares two Gaussian distributions. Right? It compares the Gaussian distribution Q with the Gaussian distribution that we're trying to um, approximate here. And then, um, yeah, and then what you're doing in your loss function you're trying to figure out how to minimize the distance between these two um, distributions. Um, yeah, and that basically is then, this predicts the diffusion posterior mean, um, and then you can use it to sample once you've trained it, and then you have to iteratively apply this reverse process and you're gonna get a real image out of this at the end of the day. Okay, so I know this was a little bit fast, and. Um, I don't want to go into all the derivations here because they are actually a little bit more complicated, but I hope that it got you a very high level overview of how the diffusion works, right? You have this forward process, we have this reverse process um, in order to recover the images. And the important thing is you have this loss function at the end of the day that basically uh, makes sure that this model P here can actually approximate the respective distribution. So it, um, it models this reverse process and um, this is something what people have been using. Uh, to train these models. And yeah, so these diffusion models, they have been used pre predominantly for image generation. Um, there's a couple of things you have to be careful about. So one thing is the input and output dimensions they actually must match. So in other words, your noise dimensionality must match with the image dimensionality. Um, there's a couple of ideas um, how to navigate this. There's things like uh, latent diffusion, then you can decouple it to a certain degree. Um, but in principle, that still holds that the input and output dimensionality must match. Um, the architecture design is pretty flexible, um, but for the most part, I mentioned this already, people use mostly units. Um, so basically, this is a unit that is kind of an autoencoder with skip connections, um, and you have some state that you store respectively as the respective condition. Um, and this is how you train these diffusion models. Um, mostly in practice, I already mentioned, yeah, like a thousand diffusion steps is, is commonly used. Um, what people play around with. Um, and the one big thing is what made these diffusion models so successful is they're incredibly scalable. So they're very, it's kind of a very interesting thing actually. So the diffusion models, they are extremely expensive to train, right? You have to go through all of these diffusion steps. They're also extremely expensive to evaluate, right? If you want to have a forward pass here, you have to go through all of these like diffusion steps, 
you have to do all these denoising steps. So you have to go, you have to run a network a thousand times, basically, right? Um, and that's comparatively speaking to a GAN architecture, it's like horribly slow. But the thing is, they're extremely easy to train, which is funny. So they're extremely slow to train, but they're easy to train in a sense that they are much, much more stable compared to GANs. Um, so if you're throwing more data and more compute at it and scale up your architectures, this is something you can do extremely well with these diffusion models. And that's what the reason success is. Um, and some of these applications basically um, involve now also conditional diffusion models. So text to image is a very popular one. I mentioned stable diffusion or the Lee. That's pretty much what these methods are doing, right? So they have basically then text as input. Um, they use this as condition at the beginning um, and then they, they run this denoising process and then they're gonna get an image out of it. And that's a thing that um, has gained a real lot of popularity. Um, however, I would like to clarify, training these models is expensive. It's like, it's very predictable, um, like how scalable in a sense, because it's very scalable. I said it's easy to train, but it's very expensive because you need to train this stuff basically like stable diffusion. I don't know, like my, my understanding was this cost like roughly on AWS training was like almost half a million or something like this, uh, just in compute cost. Like literally just renting servers, renting GPUs and running on thousands of GPUs for a certain amount of time until you got a really, really good quality model at the end of the day. Um, and this is the blessing and the curse of diffusion models. So it's, it's very, in a sense, easy to scale um, from an understanding standpoint, but it's very, very expensive to do it at some point because you just throw more computer. And this is why a lot of companies um, have a lot of success with it because they have a lot of resources and they throw these resources to scale up these models. Um, but the results, I think, are really awesome. So I mentioned stable diffusion a couple of times. So stable diffusion is actually open source, so you can use the pre-trained model and can do a bunch of stuff with it. And what people are doing is stuff like this. They do things like in-painting and out-painting. So you start with part of an image, and then you're asking the diffusion model to essentially um, fix these parts of the image and denoise the rest of the image where you haven't had any observations. And this is what you see here in this example, right? So they're doing this... This, um, this iterative in-painting of the image and using this diffusion prior that they have trained on stable diffusion here to kind of create an infinitely large image. Okay, this is not infinitely large, but you can, you can imagine you can go even, even wider and larger with that one. And the, um, the thing, what I think is really cool is that these models are actually public, so you can play around with that and you can use them actually, well, not all of them are public, like Dali is not public, but stable diffusion is public. And stable diffusion, I think, made a really big difference in the academic world because a lot of people could actually build their research on top of it. Um, there have been other works. Um, you can even go steps further than and can basically try to generate even 3D um, data out of it. Uh, in this case, the idea is um, you basically take a pre-trained diffusion model in 2D uh, and you're doing some version of distillation um, so you want to do knowledge distillation and figure out how to extract some gradients from this pre-trained model and generate like instances of 3D models. And this is something that has been done here. So they have like 3D neural radiance fields, which is a type of a 3D representation. Um, and they managed to extract these 3D models essentially just by querying the respective, um, the respective features. And I think this, this dream fusion work, um, I also hope that you have already seen it because I think this is really awesome. Um, that is definitely something that is... I think like making a big splash and has a lot of impact in reality because it's just such a cool application. Okay, that's mostly what I wanted to talk about diffusion models. Um, I now have one last topic. Um, I wanna go quickly over a bit of reinforcement learning. I wanna do this in a similar style what I have done with GANs and diffusion models. Um, I wanna give you a rough high level overview. I'm not gonna go too much into depth, but I just wanted to roughly um, get you a bit of a sense of like, you know, what the high level things are. If you're more interested in, you can look it up. Um, and then especially for potentially advanced courses for next semester, it might be also pretty interesting. Okay, so if you're talking about learning paradigms in machine learning, for the most part, what we have been looking at was supervised learning, right? So you have a classifier, a regression task, um, you have labeled data's input, and then you find a mapping from the input to the respective label, right? So the input could be an image, such as from ImageNet, and you want to predict the label, um, and it tells us which class that is. And our network, or our, our generic function approximator, this is like a fancy term, okay, we use a neural network, um, is, is basically um, learning this mapping. Okay, 
Um, and then we have this, oops, we have this paradigm of unsupervised learning. Uh, we didn't talk too much about it. We talked a little bit in the context of the autoencoders about it right now. Um, we have some clustering, anomaly detection. We have typically unlabeled data. And the point is we want to find some structure, right? Um, using an autoencoder, that's typically what you do. Like autoencoder is you reconstruct the image itself and then you do some sort of clustering in your latent codes. Um, and that's an unsupervised learner. Okay, and then we have the last category, which is now what we're going to talk about is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning for the most part is some sort of sequential data. Um, and the idea is you learning by interacting with the environment. And by learning, by interacting with the environment, you can literally think about this as a kind of a game, right? So you're playing a game and by the self-play, you're learning how to get better at that game. That's actually what reinforcement learning for the most part is actually being used for. Okay, so in a nutshell, what do we do? We have this, uh, we have an agent here. This is our reinforcement learning agent. Um, and spoiler alert, the agent will become a neural network. Um, the agent is trained um, by using a kind of a carrot stick approach, right? So we encourage when we do something right. So if good behavior is encouraged and bad behavior is discouraged by punishment. And punishment means like in terms of a loss, right? So we're having a uh, a reward that we're going to give it. A reward we will see has a very specific meaning in reinforcement learning. But it's very, like for a game, um, if I play a game of chess, right, that's pretty straightforward. If I'm winning, then I'm, I did good decisions. If I'm losing, I did very bad decisions. And the high level point here is we're going to have an agent and we're going to have an environment. And the reason why I'm um, taking examples here from Super Mario is this is something that made this stuff very popular because people trained reinforcement learning um, methods in order to play this game and learn this game just by observing this environment. Um, and this brings us to the fact how we deal with the environment. Well, we deal with the environment by having a bunch of observations. These observations T, it's a time step T, we're having a certain observation. Um, and then we have a certain action T that does something. Like um, I'm gonna press a button and I'm gonna jump around this game. And based on this action, I will then get a reward. Um, for instance, if I jump into fire, I will die. That is a negative reward. That I mean, I did something wrong with my action. And then I would like to take this reward and I would like to update my, my agent such that in the future, it's not gonna make the same mistake again. And then you kind of iterate, right? Okay. So what are the characteristics here? So the characteristics of re uh, reinforcement learning is it's by nature very sequential, right? So time matters, right? So where you are in your, in your sequence is very critical. So you need to know like the previous steps, you need to know possibly future steps. Um, and the actions, they have an effect on the environment, right? So for instance, if in Super Mario, I'm going to press a button to jump up, then I will probably generate a frame from my video game um, that displays Mario when he's jumping up. Um, and so the actions, they have an effect on the environment. This is very critical. So my actions will change what my future observations are going to look like. Um, and I don't have an explicit supervision, meaning that my there's no label that tells you, oh, this was right and this was wrong. Um, but in fact, the only thing what we have is we have our reward. And the reward is essentially an approximation of our target. And um, yeah, I said a very simple reward was you, you winning or losing, um, but the reward has a very specific meaning actually, right? Um, this is actually part of your loss function that you incorporate in order to train your agent. Okay, so now what we have is we have, a, we have this sequence, we have the sequential model, uh, and that means we have a history of, of actions, um, we have a, a, a history and we have a state. So the agent essentially makes now decisions based on the history age of observations, actions and rewards up to the time steps. So these are like all my observations, actions and rewards that I had so far, right? I just concatenated all of these ones together. This is my history. Um, and then I have my state S that contains all the necessary information that goes from, uh, uh, from age to S respectively, right? So, so we have this, this state that takes essentially all my history as input Sorry, I have my state is, de is depending on uh, age as input. So all the stuff what we had before, um, and we're mapping this to a state. And this is a function um, that we essentially learning, right? So we're trying to make sure that the state is dependent on everything you have done before. Okay, 
So now we have a little issue. Um, the issue is basically my history grows linearly over time. Um, so we want to make sure that we make this tractable. Um, in this case, we make a Markov assumption that says um, a state S is Markov if and only if, if it's basically um, dependent on the previous state. So the future is independent of the past given the present, which is kind of interesting, right? Um, so this is the Mark Markovian assumption. Um, and we basically gonna say, okay, look, um, I'm gonna have my current state. I'm gonna have my future state. And that state is essentially uh, modeled with this uh, Markov process here. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, um, we have this figure that I've already shown you. Um, so what we'd like to do is we have a agent, we have the environment, uh, and the reward in the next state are essentially functions of the current observations and the action only. And by action only, I mean, this is literally the current step, right? So I have the current observation T, um, I have the current action T, and now I need to figure out what is my reward if I feed these two things in, um, and I need to predict my next state of my model. And this is what reinforcement is doing. So mathematically speaking, um, this solution right now is essentially a Markov decision process. Um, and it's defined by all of these things here, right? So the Markov decision process is now defined by a set of possible states. It's defined by a set of possible actions. Um, these ones are um, incorporated in a distribution of rewards, right? So you have like action state pairs that tell you given my current action and given my current state, like how much is my reward gonna be. Um, I have a transition probability. So if I'm on a current action state pair, where do I go next? And then I have a discount factor um, that discounts future rewards. Um, so this discount factor is also something very specific to reinforcement learning that basically tells you like, um, like what's the, what's the long-term dependency of actions I'm taking? Or, um, Kind of a horizon effect maybe that's a better way to describe it right so discount factor tells you like how much i should penalize the influence over time right if i have a, a large discount factor then i'm penalizing it more and vice versa and i think um yeah it's very intuitive to understand it's just a question of like how much does it influence stuff over time basically okay so these are a bunch of things that we need in principle we are still very abstract still relatively high level um and what we want to do right now is we want to essentially um, train such an agent. And this agent has essentially two things. It has a policy and it has a value. Um, the policy says my behavior of my agent. So it maps from a state to an action, which is a neural network, of course, right? This is my policy here. Uh, takes input my state and the state again is dependent respectively again to all of these things what we just described. Um, and it gives me an action what I should do. And now I need to have a value and it tells me how good is for my given state this action, right? This essentially tells me then what's my expected future reward. So if I'm doing something based on the state, was that good or not good, right? Again, if you're in this video game behavior um, and you, you're like jumping into fire, um, that might be not very good, right? So then your, 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 your Q function here, your value function should basically tell you, ah, that wasn't very good, so you should get a negative reward. Uh, and this also has to be learned, learned simultaneously because um, the reinforcement learning can be done very abstractly in a sense, right? You can just do this from pure observation, so you have to learn this reward. Like nobody's telling you that jumping into fire is bad. This is only something you have to learn first based on your overreaching target at the very end of the day. And overarching target might be something like, oh, you die. Uh, so dying might be bad, um, and it means not completing the level. Um, and that means anything that leads to death in the video game was bad. And this is a function you have to basically learn. Um, so there's a bunch of different reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, there's a lot of different ones. So um, don't feel overwhelmed here. Um, there's like uh, model free, model based, um, policy optimization, Q learning, learning model and given the model. Right. There's a bunch of different ones. Um, you might have heard of things like Alpha Zero, right? They have a given model and they want to learn how to play the respective uh, game that they are given observations for. Um, so I'm not going to go over all of these, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand there's a lot of diversity also in the respective reinforcement um, learning algorithms. So why is it so popular? Well, I think the very first paper that I, um, well, I mean, I'm, 
I also did my PhD around the time. Um, so there's probably more stuff beforehand, but this is something that you know I, I saw first when people were talking about reinforcement learning um, was this um, uh, DQN uh, paper, which was basically learning to play Atari. And um, this was in 2013. And the idea was they basically had a set of different games like Pong, Breakout, Space Invaders, and so on. And they basically just with pure self-play, they figured out agents that that did well at this game. Um, it's not amazing like a pro gamer or whatever would do, but it's it's at a level where it was actually pretty competitive already. Um, and I think this was pretty interesting. Like then people started to notice that, okay, with pure self-play, without explicitly having to teach the network or the agent the rules of the game, you could actually be pretty successful at learning it to play it. Um, and then there have been a lot of works that have followed this. Um, one thing that I found particularly cool was this, this Alpha Zero um, that came up. So Alpha Zero, you might have heard um, in the context of chess, um, but they actually managed to do much more complicated stuff. Like StarCraft is a video game, um, which I really love, um, and I think it's a really cool game. Um, and they actually learned to do this mostly with self-play. It's a little bit cheating. They did a little bit of... Um, um, Actually, it's StarCraft 2 what they used here. But um, So they did a little bit of um, imitation learning first. Um, but in principle, what they have done is they used mostly self-play. And the idea what they have used is they used the model, which is a transformer-based architecture. We've talked about transformers quite a bit with an LSTM core. Um, and they trade this whole thing really a lot of time. At the time, they used um, Google TPUs. Uh, this was like... Um, Done in 2018, when they did the first version, they played against um, like uh, Mana, which was well, who is a good player, but not like the best player at the game. Uh, so he's a pro player, but he's not like one of the best players. And so he was actually, they were actually able to um, to do pretty well against him. Um, and but the very top players, um, they still couldn't beat at this time. And then afterwards, they they improved. Yeah, and for me, for me personally, this was actually extremely exciting because I always thought, well, doing these real-time strategy games well is actually extremely difficult for an AI to learn. And to me, this was one of the first times when actually people showed very compelling results. Um, however, at the same time, I should say, like even since then, I mean, like 2018, 2019, when DeepMind did this kind of stuff, um, there's been a bit of progress. Um, but it actually takes quite a lot of resources to pull off a project like this. So this is not something that is so easy and you still would train on a single computer at home or so. This still takes a cluster. It's very expensive to do. You need a lot of training data. Um, but I think it's really awesome and cool. All right. Um, I hope this was a cool thing. Um, if you're interested in this, you should definitely check it out. Um, but with that, we are mostly through the topics right now from introduction to deep learning. Um, I wanted to give a very quick summary again. Um, of high-level things we've talked about. And I wanted to also talk a little bit about possible future activities um, of future courses you could possibly take. So, I mean, the main thing we've talked about at the beginning was we talked about these machine learning basics. And I still think this high-level concept is extremely important. So if you're talking about machine learning, the whole point is always the same. You're going to have a training set, from this training set, you're going to fit a function to this training set and you hope that this generalizes to new samples. That's always the same thing, right? You And in the history of machine learning, there have been different function approximators that people have used to fit to a training set. Um, and one thing that turns out to work pretty well there is neural networks as a function approximator, right? But always, it's always an optimization problem, right? That we're fitting to some training set um, and then we're hoping it generalizes. Um, and we talked about all of these things right now, right? We talked about how to do the supervised versus unsupervised learning. We talked about linear versus logistic regression at the beginning. We talked about data splitting, how we probably evaluate it, um, and so on. Um, and then, you know, once we, we had these high-level concepts and we understood that all we had to do is we had to have a good function approximator that we can fit to the training set, um, then we figured out how we do this in practice. So in practice, how we do this, this function fitting is basically this neural network right now, right? This neural network has now an architecture. Um, it has um, MLPs, it could have convolutions, 
it has activation functions. And then what we want to do is we want to formulate this whole thing as an optimization problem and say, based on the training samples, how do we find the right parameters of your neural network to best approximate this training set, right? Um, and the way we did this, we had to compute gradients. So all the optimizations we are dealing done is, is gradient based. We had to use backpropagation to do this efficiently. Um, we also talked about how, how to execute these things on a modern GPU, for instance. And then we talked about how the actual optimizers are working, right? We talked about once we had these gradients, how we update these parameters P, we had all kinds of different um, versions of SGD optimizers. And, um, and then we talked about things like regularization, parameter interpretation, training curves and stuff like that. Um, and this point of regularization, I think was pretty important because we actually wanted to make sure that you know, once we're training this on a training set, we had this concept of overfitting and underfitting, right? We wanted to make sure that it actually then generalizes to the respective uh, validation or later on the test set that we cared about, right? Um, and this is something that we had to, to deal with a lot, right? The whole point is always we had this big optimization function. We had to figure out how we get gradients. We had to find how we optimize the parameters. And then we had to make sure that, you know, like, don't fit too much maybe, like, you know, regularize a bit and then make sure that it generalizes to new things. Uh, and this is a lot of things that we've talked about. And when you're doing a deep learning project in practice, that's also what you're gonna do a lot. You're gonna look at your training curves, you're gonna look at your validation curves, you're gonna check out how these correlate, do they go down enough? Can you overfit at the beginning, right? And then, then successively you're gonna build up your projects. Um, we talked a lot about now high-level concepts as well. Um, we talked of CNNs a lot, like convolutional networks, we talked about RNNs, we talked about autoencoders um, today, we talked about GANs, um, we talked about transformers a lot, right? Like all these kind of things that we can then do on top of it, how to kind of restructure these architectures in order to make them work better for certain tasks and purposes. Um, yeah, and I don't know, I think this was kind of cool. And I hope you, you got a good understanding. Um, for me, it's actually always very important that people understand these core concepts of machine learning, right? Again, you have this function, you wanna fit this function to some training data, and then you hope that it generalizes. That's the main core that I hope I could convey um, in this course. Now, I also wanted to take a moment and talk a, a little bit about other deep learning courses um, here at TUM. Um, I have to say this with a caveat because these courses they tend to change over time depending on who is teaching them, when people are teaching it, and sometimes people um, also um, change the curriculum, generally speaking, a little bit. Um, but so far in practice, we have these two major courses here at TUM, right? We have this Intro to Deep Learning course, um, and we have this uh, machine learning course that is um, taught by Professor Gunnemann. Um, so the idea is that these two are ideally complementary. I hope that's the case, right? So with this course focusing very strictly um, on neural networks and whether the other core machine learning course focuses a bit more on traditional methods. Um, but then we have a lot of lectures right now around it, and I'm sure I'm not, I'm not having all of them here, but the core idea is basically with these two lectures, you have a bit of a, a high level understanding first, you know how the, the foundations work, right? And then you can specialize in certain areas a bit more, right? So for instance, we have deep learning in physics from um, Niels Turai, we have machine learning for 3D geometry by Professor Dai. We have deep learning robotics by Boimel. Um, we have deep learning for medical applications. I think Bjorn Menze actually left, so he's not teaching that anymore. So I'm not sure who took that over, but I'm sure the course still exists. Um, and we have also advanced deep learning for computer vision. Um, that's a course that I'm typically teaching every semester. Okay. Um, and the idea here is of course, um, since this is such an awesome topic and it's so amazing and we can do so many cool things, um, we are consistently pushing to also keeping expanding these courses. Um, so there might be a few of them that I don't even know about because we also have a larger faculty right now. Um, but I think there's a lot, of, a lot of cool topics that you can choose from right now. Um, so this is the introductory course, right? And we hope that basically this introductory course serves as a basis to then later on take the other courses. Um, and my ideal scenario for like students um, who are currently interested in these areas is they basically start by taking the introductory course, which is hopefully what you have been doing right now for the last few months. Um, and then you basically then specialize into the advanced topics. Um, and in these advanced topics, you can then get more knowledge about the respective domain. For instance, I'm very interested in visual computing. I love to use generative models. I would love to capture reality. I love these diffusion models. 
Um, anything like that, that that creates pretty pictures and can capture reality and can create digital abstractions, that's something I really love doing. Um, and these kind of things, um, they're already a little bit more specialized, but you need these foundations, what we have taught in this basic course now, right? Um, and then afterwards, this is ideally a preparation for the master thesis topics, right? So the idea is you take first the introductory courses, then you take the respective specialized advanced courses, and then you're eventually moving forward to um, things like a guided research, maybe first still, or maybe a practical, and then you do a master thesis in these more specialized directions. So this is kind of the high level idea. Um, obviously, the master's here is relatively flexible and you have um, quite a few alternatives how to do it. Um, but this is kind of a, you know, what the course organizers had in mind when we designed the curriculum here. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about these advanced courses. Um, I wanted to specifically um, give you a bit of a hint of um, um, what I'm looking for. So I have this advanced deep learning course for computer vision. Um, I call it visual computing actually right now. Um, and the idea is that we actually want to deal a lot with these generative models, right? We have advanced architectures. We're going to talk about things like Siamese networks. We're going to talk about NERFs, neural radiance fields. If you haven't heard about these ones, you should definitely look it up. Uh, we're going to talk about neural fields, neural scene representations, scene representation networks, and more generative models like GANs, diffusion, and so on. All this kind of stuff, this is what we're going to do. We want, we want to really go into the detail here. And the idea is that these courses, specifically this course, is one of them that is very focused on practicals, right? So there will be some theory part, but there will also be a project. So there's no like weekly exercises or like bi-weekly exercises, but there's going to be a, a basically a semester long project where you can get your hands dirty and train your own networks for your specific tasks. So there's a very, very strong focus on the practical part. Um, and this practical part is a project that will actually last the whole semester, so you will have a lot of time doing it. And that is a course that actually requires, for instance, introduction to deep learning. Um, for the most part, we also, um, yeah, this is like a bit of criticism sometimes, we also have to limit, unfortunately, the people who are taking it. So for the most part, we're taking about 40 to 50 people um, at most. Um, because what we're doing now is we're having a lot of PhD students from my group. They're actually working with you very, very closely on these projects. So we have a very good advisor to advisee relationship um, such that you know what you're doing in these projects. Right? So this is a course that I think is extremely exciting. It takes a lot of effort. So only a sign up if you're actually willing to spend the effort on a, on a long project. But if you want to go into these areas like generative models, visual computing, um, generative AI, diffusion models, generative GANs, and stuff like this. This is the course to go, um, but be aware that it is a lot of effort, and um, we also do a bit of a selection in terms of people who did well in the introduction to the learning course, right? So keep that in mind um, that there's a lot of people are interested in, but we also we also trying to make sure these courses have very very good supervision. So we are focusing um, on working with the people here very closely. Anyway, this is kind of my, 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 my heart, <laughs> why I like it so much of being a professor here. Um, I really love following these student projects and it's very cool to work on stuff that is really cutting edge, um, even early in your research careers, respectively. Yeah. Also, if you're interested in doing a PhD and so on later, that's probably a course you should consider taking, right? Okay, um, there's other courses. There's um, Machine Learning for 3D Geometry by Professor Dai, that one I also want to advertise. Um, it's very similar. They also have um, they have a lecture and practical part to it. They also have projects um, attached to it. They focus more on geometry and shapes. So they focus um, a bit on the intersection of computer graphics, geometric processing here. Um, they have geometric foundations. They work on shape descriptors. They work on 3D segmentation methods. And um, they basically lift the whole thing from 2D to 3D in a sense, right? Um, I should also say this is a super, super cool course. Um, definitely check that out too. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I hope this is also very interesting to you. Okay, a few more administrative things I wanted to mention for this course. Um, we're gonna have an invited lecture on Monday, um, this Monday. Um, and this is a, a lecture by Ben Poole. Um, he's a, a researcher um, at Google. And they are working a lot on diffusion models. So specifically, he's been the first author of this amazing work of Dream Fusion. 
And the idea there is basically to distill some information out of these diffusion models to create 3D representations. So this is going to be live streamed um, on YouTube. So you can just go on my YouTube channel. I put the link here too. Um, and you see this um, actually being live streamed. You can also use the chat and ask, um, interact um, and ask the questions basically. Um, we will then um, try to forward these questions. Um, and I think this is hopefully a good opportunity to see a little bit with, you know, what you can do in this area. And I think this is so cool with all the stuff that's coming out right now that this is, I don't know, I hope this gives you a lot of inspiration. So um, for me, like, I mean, I've been seeing this many, many times already. And I'm always, every time I see something in this area, I'm so excited. And I want to do even more uh, cool research here. Um, so for me, this is always a really, really good motivation. Yeah, so definitely join us here. I think this is going to be very exciting. It's going to be pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then finally, um, for the exam, um, so we're already in, in preparation mode for the exam. I hope you are too. Um, so there will be no retake exam this semester. However, there will be, of course, uh, an exam retake next semester, right? So this semester, there will only be one exam, but there will be another exam in the next semester. And that is... Um, something that we always did, right? We basically offering this course every semester and that's the trade-off. Um, so we, we don't have a retake exam this one. Okay, uh, so there will be no cheat sheet, there will be no calculator. Um, we trying to post on online um, in the forum, we're gonna post a bit um, of, of high-level organizational stuff. Um, our team of TAs will hopefully help you there. Um, and I hope, yeah, I hope this will be very clear and you're already also starting to prepare for the exam. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's mostly it, what I wanted to say. Um, the final thing, I want to say good luck in the exam. Um, as I said, it's pretty important um, if you want to continue in these areas because um, this is how we also find good students eventually um, from the advisory side. Um, I hope you enjoyed this course. I definitely did. For me, it was a lot of fun. I decided to record it online. The course will be on YouTube and you can hopefully um, yeah, rewatch it for the exam preparation and hopefully it's going to help you also a little bit. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks a lot for watching it. Um, see you, take care and bye-bye.